The Higher Power of Lucky, Chapter Twelve, Parsley. After dinner, Lucky stood at the sink washing the dishes. She was still thinking a little bit about Mrs. Prender, but mostly about parsley. Before Bridget came to Hartpen, Lucky had never imagined that parsley would be so important. Usually, if she even noticed it, it was because of being in a fancy place like Smithy's Family Restaurant in Sierra City, where a hamburger came on a plate with a frizz of parsley for decoration. You noticed Smithy's fanciness right away because of how the waitress Lulu neatly rolled up. Every one's fork, knife, spoon set in its paper napkin, like a little present. This made you feel especially welcomed. Another excellent quality of Smithy's was that, if you asked her, Lulu would bring two extra lemon wedges for your fish stick at no extra charge, on a tiny plate especially made for that type of delicacy. Some people's tiny plates had olives. Spread, speared, speared by toothpicks, with cellophane ruffles, or the sprig of parsley with a burger, which Smithy's family restaurant probably realized wasn't necessary, the way ketchup was, but which gave a certain elegance. Lucky noticed that most people in Smithy's didn't actually eat their parsley. It was just there for the fanciness of making a pretty green decoration, and also because it looked healthy and made health-conscious people not worry so much about the bad cholesterol teeming around in their juicy hamburger. To Bridget, parsley was essential, but not in the same way at Smithy's. She chopped it into tiny bits and sprinkled it over par- practically everything. Including food that regular people don't even realize goes with pars- parsley, she fancied it over cucumbers, noodle soup, beans, and garlic toast. She added it to gravy, eggs, melted butter dip, and especially especially to free government food. And deep down, Lucky had to admit that it gave everything a cleanness and an herbness. Without being show-offish or make you think, oh, parsley again. Since Bridget was so crazy about parsley, Lucky should have been surprised that in France there is a sp- there is a special little hand grinder for it, where you stuff the parsley into a funnel and turn the handle, and presto, perfect tiny fresh flakes come out underneath. You don't need a knife or cutting board or anything. You could just go right up to the dish and turn the handle. No fuss, no muss. Of course, Bridget's old mother had sent her a parsley grinder right off the bat when Bridget told her how much she missed having one, and Bridget had cried and acted like it was the best present she ever got in the world. It was the parsley grinder's fault that Lucky hit rock bottom on Sunday after she came home from the Smokers Anonymous meeting. Bridget made melted cheese and sliced tomato, open-faced sandwich with flakes of parsley on top for dinner. Lucky ate only half of hers because she wasn't too hungry, and she let Bridget think this was because of the heat, instead of because of short sammies, fritos, and chili. But Lucky did have room for a piece of clafouti, which is a pancake-ish style of pie with fruit in it. This one had government surplus canned apricots, but you couldn't tell they weren't regular canned ca- apricots. It was the parsley grinder's fault, because the only thing Lucky did was to clean it in her usual thorough way after dinner, while she was at the sink. Mouse came by. Making screeching tire sounds to forage for cookies, Bridget ruffled his hair and said he could he could have a piece of clafouti. As she washed the grinder, Lucky bent one of the little spokes spokes a teeny bit. She did it completely one hundred percent by accident and didn't even realize. But when she put the two clean parts together, snapping the spokes. 
back into the funnel, she discovered that the handle wouldn't turn. She showed Bridget. Bridget said, "Oh, la vache," which means, as Lucky had learned, "Oh, the cow." But she said it the way you would say, "Oh, what a pain," or "Oh, good grief." It was never really about cows whatsoever when Bridget said, "Oh, la vache." Bridget tried to bend the spoke back to its normal position, when she made a pff sound of being frustrated. Miles swallowed a mouthful of coffee and said, "You should get Dot to fix that parsley thing. She has lots of pliers and little jewelry tools." Wait a sec, Lucky said. Let me try first. She got a table knife and very carefully wedged the spoke back to its place. But she bent the next spoke in another wrong direction. Bridget sighed and went to the phone. "Hello, Dot," she said when she dialed. "You mostly didn't need a phone book in Hartpan because everybody's phone number began with the same first three numbers, so you only had to remember the other four." Dots were nine eight seven six. Easy. Can we come over with a little thing to fix? We need to borrow those pliers with a tiny ant. Lucky and Miles watched Bridget talk. She used one hand to hold the phone and the other to show the tapering ends of the pliers, even though Dot couldn't see her doing it. You're not too busy, Bridget said to Dot. Okay. Yes. Right now, she hung up. Lucky, I'm going to wrap some clafoti to take to Dot. Can you look for the keys of the jeep? I think, on my desk. Miles, we drop you home on the way. As Lucky went to Bridget's bedroom trailer, Miles began making screeching tire noises again. The key was not on the table. Lucky looked all around the room. I can't find. I can't find them. She called to Bridget. Look in the drawer. Um, Bridget called back. Lucky opened the drawer. Scissors, a tape measure, stamps, pencils, rubber bands. No keys. She closed the drawer and noticed Bridget's little suitcase on a chair beside the table. It was closed, but the lid wasn't wasn't zipped. Never mind, Lucky. Bridget shouted. I find them in here. Lucky had had a bad feeling about that suitcase, which had always been stored at the back of Bridget's closet. Lucky, are you coming to Dot's? Lucky stared at the suitcase. No, she called, backing away from it. She went to the kitchen doorway. I'll stay here and, uh, work more on my end report. You should anyway get ready for bed, Bridget said. School tomorrow. I come back soon. Miles' tire screeched all the way to the jeep. Lucky went straight back to the suitcase. It was a bit bigger and deeper than a laptop carrier. Bridget had come all the way from France with that one small case, thinking she was staying only a short while, a short time, until Lucky could be placed in a foster home. Probably she brought just a change of clothes. Now she had plenty of cotton surgical outfit from the thrift shop, which Lucky knew she liked because they were loose fitting and cool, and because Bridget said they made her feel Californian. Plus, she had the jeep and the th- the three trailers, and the computer that Lucky's father had given her. Plus, she had Lucky. This was the first time Lucky had seen the suitcase in two years. Lucky lifted the lid. There were no clothes in it, only a stack of papers, and on top something very precious that was usually kept in a safe deposit box at the bank in Sierra City, Bridget's passport. Lucky didn't touch it or look at the other papers. Usually she would have examined them all very thoroughly, but the passport was enough. The only reason people need a passport is when they travel from one country to another country. Now she realized what was going on. Lucky trudged back to the kitchen trailer. 
she suddenly understood that she'd been doing everything backward. She'd thought you looked for your higher power, and when you found it, you got special knowledge, some special insight about how the world works and why people die, and how to keep bad things from happening. But now she knew that wasn't the right order of things. Over and over at the anonymous meetings, she'd heard people tell how their situation had gotten worse and worse and worse, until they'd hit rock bottom. Only after they'd they'd hit rock bottom did they get control of their lives, and then they found their higher power. Another part of finding your higher power was to do a fearless and searching, moral inventory of yourself. But Lucky was too mad for fearless and searching moral inventory. She was too hopeless. She'd do it later. Right now, she had proof that Bridget was going back to France. That put Lucky at rock bottom. The anonymous people struggled with the next step after rock bottom, the getting control of your life step. Lucky pounced. Lucky pounded the formica table with both fists. Which made HMS Beagle leap to her feet and look at Lucky worriedly. It's almost impossible to get control of your life when you're only ten. It's another. It's other people, adults, who have control of your life because they can abandon you. They can die like Lucky's mother. They can decide they won't. They don't even want you like Lucky's father. And they can return to France as suddenly and easily as they left it, like Bridget. And even if you can carry a survival kit around with you all the time, it won't guarantee you'll survive. No kit in the world can protect you from all the possible bad things. But don't give up hope, Lucky said to HMS Beagle in a calming voice, because she didn't want her dog to worry. HMS Beagle looked a little reassured, and she said, "But she still watched Lucky to see what was going to happen." I have an idea, Lucky told her slowly, thinking her thoughts from the bottom of her deep, rock-bottom pit. I have an idea of something we can do to take control of our lives. It's kind of scary. We can run away. Lucky peered intently at HMS Beagle to see if she was willing. HMS Beagle was.